When the war started, my father took my mother on a journey, a journey unwanted by either of them, away from home and far from their city, into exile next to our little feet and hands. My mother carried her box of sewing needles and her butterfly sewing machine made in the USSR. Moving between rented rooms, fabric became a land familiar to her. Opening her box and resting her sewing machine on the floor, she made dresses of different colors and textures. Kabul gave her velvet in all colors. She chose the colors of leather and ocean, burgundy and royal blue. Pakistan gave her satin and yellow and orange. She prefers something onion colored. India gave her cotton and thick and thin. She selected something in between. One year, she learned to spin coarse wool and with the money she earned, she bought silk. She waited, I waited, until the hard skin on the tips of her fingers softened before she touched the silk. She then made dresses for her three daughters, Parwana, Shapnam, and Gauhar, and colors pistachio, red rose, and sea green. Every stitch of her needle gave life to elegant styles of youth and an Afghan mother's pride, even in exile. The other poem is about my aunt, who was a poet, and but she could never pursue that passion that she had into writing poetry and to publishing them. Um, so this poem is really dedicated to her. The Silent Poet. I remember an ever-recent ever young woman Every time I visited, she would fill the pockets of my coat with dried apricots, mulberries, and almonds. The most educated girl in her family, she had passed her sixth grade education and grown up on Kabul University Road. She loved poetry. She wore the mini skirts and socks of the day. The youngest of her five siblings, she was also the bravest. She spoke against her father's second marriage. Her faith was sealed when my grandfather Grass played Kabul with his two wives, Line and Good Fortune, four sons and seven daughters, and returned to the family's village in Ghazi. My mother's sister, Sadiqa, was the only unmarried child from the first wife and the oldest remaining daughter. I remember her subdued face in her white wedding dress, her dark brown hair in the shape of a crown, the mirror image of my mother. Grandfather Grass hatched a master plan. He would arrange a marriage for his daughter and then send grandmother Line to Iran to her sons his plan was successful. Once in the village, where life was lived between the feet of cows and the men wearing rifles on their shoulders, Siddiqa was forcibly married off to a man who knew only of cows and goats. And her marriage to this man was a punishment. My mother says the same words every time he insults her in public. I remember at the time of her marriage, Siddiqa couldn't say a word. People saw it as her defeat and danced with their scarves running across their faces. And this time, and in the years that came after, she was silent, but not deaf. The music of the mud river, the singing of moss butterflies, and the memory of Grandmother Lyne's tears gave life to her poetry. In the stalls and herding, she quietly wrote of her and her mother's hardship. 
She remained quiet for years. Then she returned to Kabul. She was reunited with grandmother Lime after 15 years. She read her poems. Grandmother Lime, despite her faded memory, cried tears at the waterfall. I did not understand why grandmother Lime was crying, but she must have been thinking of the poet her daughter had been in her childhood. But what uses the memory that cannot speak? I remember I met Sadika again, too. Once again, she filled my pockets with dried fruits. But this time, she also put in a letter for me to read to my mother. Her letter was a poem that whispered of her invisible wounds and the healing that came to her from seeing my mother. She had been quiet all this time. For they had advised her, put a rock in between your teeth and don't let it fall, otherwise you will be punished. Writing poetry, no one could punish her. The rock did not fall, her illiterate husband did not mind the papers. He was not aware that he was the fuel for the fire raging within her. Now, Tadika writes her poems like WhatsApp messages and shares them with her siblings. Her poetry makes sense of the past, as if she can heal herself and others only with words. Um, the, the, the next poem is called Wolf Rider. Um, it's, it's the name, it's a nickname for the village that I grew up with who grew up in and um, and and the story is always around the household and around everywhere you go people refers to the village of the wolf rider and you know which village that refers to because of this mythical story that goes along um, the history of the place wolf rider in a village where my parents lived with their children there was always a stream flowing, clear as glass. Some said the stream was from the glacier on the central mountains. The elders advised the stream sprang from God's mercy. The region around the stream also sheltered white wolves. They came from the northern region, people said. I watched the wolves become wilder in winter. The chickens were kept inside the locked gates. The men carried their guns. The women repeatedly recited sorrows, and the children wore their prayer amulets around their necks. There was a famous fable about this village that was told to children in winter. Many years ago, there was a woman. Her name was Bahtai. She did not fear to walk outside alone in the cold winter, in the cold night. She was found one dawn, paralyzed, her body half white and half black. The villagers said it was certainly a ghost. She was cursed. She saw the wolves. A giant white wolf was found lifeless next to her. The woman had wrapped her scarf like a bridle around the neck of the wolf and rode all night, like one rides a horse into the mountains. Both were exhausted from their long ride. The wolf died before the sunrise. The woman died two days later. After her death, the village came to be known as Bakhtai Gurgi, the wolf Bakhtai's village. The villagers said, they became a wolf. Each winter, my mother would tell me this story. Did Bakhtai really become a wolf? I asked as a child. No, she killed the wolf, my mother replied. One winter, when I was older, I understood. Bakhtai had met a wolf that night in her yard alone. She did not scream. She did not call to the men with guns. Instead, she died, daring to be brave. 